Lesson 7 Covenant at Sinai Sabbath Afternoon May 8 Now mark the words of the Lord. I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. The Lord is not regardless of his people, and he will punish and reprove everyone who oppresses them. He hears every groan. He listens to every prayer. He observes the movements of everyone. He approves or condemns every action. The Lord of heaven is represented as raising up the fallen. He is the friend of all who love and fear him, and he will punish everyone who dares to lead them astray from safe paths, putting them in positions of distress as they conscientiously endeavor to keep the way of the Lord and reach the abodes of the righteous. The Upward Look, page 364. The Lord commanded Moses to go and speak unto Pharaoh, bidding him to allow Israel to leave Egypt. For four hundred years they had been in Egypt and had been in slavery to the Egyptians. They had been corrupted by idolatry, and the time came when God called them forth from Egypt in order that they might obey his laws and keep his Sabbath, which he had instituted in Eden. He spoke the Ten Commandments to them in awful grandeur from Mount Sinai that they might understand the sacred and enduring character of the law and build up the foundation of many generations by teaching their children the binding claims of God's holy precepts. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 287 Among Christ's hearers, many were drawn to him in faith. And to them he said, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. These words offended the Pharisees. The nation's long subjection to a foreign yoke they disregarded and angrily exclaimed, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus looked upon these men, the slaves of malice, whose thoughts were bent upon revenge, and sadly answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. They were in the worst kind of bondage, ruled by the spirit of evil. Every soul that refuses to give himself to God is under the control of another power. He is not his own. He may talk of freedom, but he is in the most abject slavery. He is not allowed to see the beauty of truth, for his mind is under the control of Satan. While he flatters himself that he is following the dictates of his own judgment, he obeys the will of the Prince of Darkness. Christ came to break the shackles of sin slavery from the soul. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets us free from the law of sin and death. Romans chapter 8, verse 2. The Desire of Ages, page 466. Sunday, May 9. On Eagle's Wings. Often had God revealed himself as one full of compassion and gracious, long suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm 86, verse 15. When Israel was a child, he testified, Then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 Tenderly had the Lord dealt with Israel in their deliverance from Egyptian bondage and in their journey to the promised land. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Isaiah chapter 63, verse 9. My presence shall go with thee, was the promise given during the journey through the wilderness. Exodus chapter 33, verse 14. This assurance was accompanied by a marvelous revelation of Jehovah's character, which enabled Moses to proclaim to all Israel the goodness of God and to instruct them fully concerning the attributes of their invisible king. 
the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. Prophets and Kings, pages 311 and 312. Thy brother, sick in spirit, needs thee as thou thyself has needed a brother's love. He needs the experience of one who has been as weak as he, one who can sympathize with him and help him. The knowledge of our own weakness should help us to help another in his need. Never should we pass by one suffering soul without seeking to impart to him the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. It is fellowship with Christ, personal contact with a living Savior, that enables the mind and heart and soul to triumph over the lower nature. Tell the wanderer of an almighty hand that will hold him up, of an infinite humanity in Christ that pities him. It is not enough for him to believe in law and force, things that have no pity and never hear the call for help. He needs to clasp a hand that is warm to trust in a heart full of tenderness. Keep his mind stayed on the thought of a divine presence ever beside him, ever looking upon him with pitying love. Bid him think of a father's heart that ever grieves over sin, of a father's hand stretched out still, of a father's voice saying, Let him take hold of my strength and make peace with me. Isaiah chapter 27 verse 5 In Heavenly Places, page 295 when the afflicted ones came to Christ, he beheld not only those who asked for help, but all who throughout the ages should come to him in like need and with like faith. So with all the promises of God's word, in them he is speaking to us individually, speaking as directly as if we could listen to his voice. It is in these promises that Christ communicates to us his grace and power. They are leaves from that tree, which is for the healing of the nations. Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. The Ministry of Healing, page 122. Monday, May 10. The Pattern of Salvation. Remember that working with Christ as your personal Savior is your strength and your victory. This is the part that all are to act. To those who do this comes the assurance, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. John chapter 1 verse 12. Christ declares, Without me, ye can do nothing. John chapter 15 verse 5. And the humble believing soul responds, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. Christ is the sympathetic, compassionate Redeemer. He has given His commission, Go ye into all the world. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. All must hear the message of warning. A prize of richest value is held up before those who are running the Christian race. Those who run with patience will receive a crown of life that fadeth not away. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 39. Christ is the sympathetic, compassionate Redeemer. In His sustaining power, men and women become strong to resist evil. As the convicted sinner looks at sin, it becomes to him exceeding sinful. He wonders that he did not come to Christ before. He sees that his faults must be overcome and that his appetites and passions must be subjected to God's will, that he must be a partaker of the divine nature, having overcome the corruption that is in the world through lust. Having repented of his transgression of God's law, he strives earnestly to overcome sin. He seeks to reveal the power of Christ's grace, and he is brought into personal touch with the Savior. Constantly he keeps Christ before him. Praying, believing, receiving the blessings he needs, he comes nearer and nearer to God's standard for him. New virtues are revealed in his character as he denies self and lifts the cross, following where Christ leads the way. 
He loves the Lord Jesus with his whole heart, and Christ becomes his wisdom, his righteousness, his sanctification, and his redemption. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 151. Christ clothed his divinity with humanity that humanity might touch humanity, that he might live with humanity and bear all the trials and afflictions of man. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. In his humanity, he understood all the temptations that will come to man. According to the law Christ himself gave, the forfeited inheritance was ransomed by the nearest of kin. Jesus Christ laid off his royal robe, his kingly crown, and clothed his divinity with humanity in order to become a substitute and surety for humanity, that dying in humanity he might by his death destroy him who had the power of death. He could not have done this as God, but by coming as man, Christ could die. By death he overcame death. The death of Christ bore to the death him who had the power of death, and open the gates of the tomb for all who receive him as their personal Savior. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 925. Tuesday, May 11. The Sinai Covenant The Hebrew nation were in servitude for a great number of years, but the Lord was not indifferent to their condition. He had not forgotten his oppressed people. The record says, God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect unto them. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Though they had lost in years of bondage the knowledge of the true God and of his holy law, yet God again revealed himself to them. In terrible grandeur and awful majesty, he proclaimed to them his holy precepts and commanded them to obey his law. The Ten Commandments are a transcript of the divine character and are as unchangeable as the eternal throne. The Southern Work, pages 41 and 42. Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us, and now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your Savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake, you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. More than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. You are to maintain this connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. So you may say, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Steps to Christ, page 62. Amid the perplexities that will press upon the soul, there is only one who can help us out of all our difficulties and relieve all our disquietude. We are to cast all our care upon Jesus and bear in mind that he is present and is directing us to commune with him. We are to keep our minds stayed upon God, and in our weakness, he will be our strength. In our ignorance, he will be our wisdom. In our frailty, he will be our enduring might. We may be assured that we need not go into the heavens to bring Jesus down to us, neither into the deep to bring him up, for he is at our right hand and his eye is ever upon us. We should ever seek to realize that the Lord is very near us, to be our counselor, and guide. Sons and Daughters of God, page 27. Wednesday, May 12. 
God and Israel Paul learned that there was no power in the law to pardon the transgressor of law. By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 The Lord saw our fallen condition. He saw our need of grace. And because He loved our souls, He has given us grace and peace. Grace means favor to one who is undeserving, to one who is lost. The fact that we are sinners, instead of shedding us away from the mercy and love of God, makes the exercise of His love to us a positive necessity in order that we may be saved. Christ says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. John chapter 15, verse 16. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 347. The work of gaining salvation is one of co-partnership, a joint operation. There is to be cooperation between God and the repentant sinner. This is necessary for the formation of right principles in the character. Man is to make earnest efforts to overcome that which hinders him from attaining to perfection, but he is wholly dependent upon God for success. Human effort of itself is not sufficient. Without the aid of divine power, it avails nothing. God works and man works. Resistance of temptation must come from man, who must draw his power from God. On the one side, there is infinite wisdom, compassion, and power. On the other, weakness, sinfulness, absolute helplessness. God wishes us to have the mastery over ourselves, but He cannot help us without our consent and cooperation. The Divine Spirit works through the powers and faculties given to man. Of ourselves, we are not able to bring the purposes and desires and inclinations into harmony with the will of God, but if we are willing to be made willing, the Savior will accomplish this for us casting down our imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 The Acts of the Apostles, page 482 Justification by faith in Christ will be made manifest in transformation of character. This is the sign to the world of the truth of the doctrines we profess. The daily evidence that we are a living church is seen in the fact that we are practicing the Word. A living testimony goes forth to the world in consistent Christian action. This matter is so dimly comprehended that thousands upon thousands claiming to be sons of God are children of the wicked one, because they will depend on their own works. God always demanded good works. The law demands it. But because man placed himself in sin, where his good works were valueless, Jesus' righteousness alone can avail. Christ is able to save to the uttermost, because he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1071. Thursday, May 13. Promises, Promises. While the law is holy, the Jews could not attain righteousness by their own efforts to keep the law. The disciples of Christ must obtain righteousness of a different character from that of the Pharisees if they would enter the kingdom of heaven. God offered them, in His Son, the perfect righteousness of the law. If they would open their hearts fully to receive Christ, then the very life of God, His love, would dwell in them, transforming them into his own likeness. And thus, through God's free gift, they would possess the righteousness which the law requires. But the Pharisees rejected Christ. Being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, Romans chapter 10, verse 3, they would not submit themselves unto the righteousness of God. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 54. It is the sophistry of Satan that the death of Christ brought in grace to take the place of the law. 
The death of Jesus did not change or annul or lessen in the slightest degree the law of Ten Commandments. That precious grace offered to men through a Savior's blood establishes the law of God. Since the fall of man, God's moral government and His grace are inseparable. They go hand in hand through all dispensations. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Psalm 85, verse 10. Jesus, our substitute, consented to bear for man the penalty of the law transgressed. He clothed his divinity with humanity and thus became the Son of Man, a Savior and Redeemer. The very fact of the death of God's dear Son to redeem man shows the immutability of the divine law. How easily, from the transgressor's standpoint, could God have abolished his law, thus providing a way whereby men could be saved and Christ remain in heaven? The doctrine which teaches freedom through grace to break the law is a fatal delusion. Every transgressor of God's law is a sinner, and none can be sanctified while living in known sin. Faith and Works, page 30. Whatever the character of your sin, confess it. If it is against God only, confess only to Him. If you have wronged or offended others, confess also to them and the blessing of the Lord will rest upon you. In this way, you die to self, and Christ is formed within. Those who acknowledge reproof and correction as from God, and are thus enabled to see and correct their errors, are learning precious lessons even from their mistakes. Their apparent defeat is turned into victory. They stand, trusting not to their own strength, but to the strength of God. They have earnestness, zeal, and affection, united with humility and regulated by the precepts of God's word. They walk not stumblingly, but safely, in a path where the light of heaven shines. That I may know him, page 239. For further reading, Lift Him Up, Created in God's Image, page 48, and Patriarchs and Prophets, The Law Given to Israel, pages 303 to 314.